In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, all God's people said, Amen. Father, we praise you, we bless you. We thank you for this great series on Jesus praying. We lack in our prayer life, we lack in praying, we lack in seeking you. Teach us how to pray. Pray through us in the power and the might of the Holy Spirit. So that we can have a, the revelation of the mighty God. And we can exalt you in all things. So glorify your name in our midst, Lord. And have the power and the might of your majesty. To fall afresh on us. And give us grace understanding. Glory be to the Father. And to the Son. And to the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Is now and ever shall be. World without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, we've been working on Luke 22. We've been doing the prayer before meal, and we've been showing you the prayer after meal. When you say the first advent, the coming of the Lord, you say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. When the second coming comes, you say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. So for you to understand the second coming, you have to match up with your prayer life of the first coming. So let's go to Luke chapter 22, verse 17. And he took a chalice, and when he had given thanks, he said, now how do you say give thanks? Eucharistian. For I tell you, I shall not eat until I fulfill the kingdom of God. Remember, there again are the two what? Everybody see the two kingdoms? Now, the two kingdoms have a lot to do with the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ. Do you see that? Now, when you go home to heaven, you're going to be eating this side of heaven, and then you'll be eating the other side of heaven. That's why the height of all we do is built around the meal. Or the, as we would carefully say, the holy sacrifice. Now, verse 17, and he said, take took a cup, and when you give it thanks, I underline it again, Eucharistian. You take this and divide it among yourselves. And now remember, there were four cups. At each cup, there was a praying before and after. So now, this, the four cups, it's about a man getting his woman for wedding. The first cup is to deliver her. The second cup is to take her on the journey to be with him. The third cup is where we receive the Eucharist. It's called the cup of redemption. So that is the marriage of the lamb. How many think that's beautiful? So when you receive Jesus in the Eucharist, you're going to the marriage of the lamb. Now, when we go to the marriage of the lamb, then we can see there's a fourth cup. But the fourth cup is not mentioned. But the mentioning of it would be in Isaiah 53, which is the crucifixion, which is the blood pouring out of Jesus' side. Now, the third cup is redeeming you. The fourth cup is your honeymoon with the master. Now, notice here in Luke, we've been pointing out to you there are two different cups. So the first cup there mentioned is, let's see verse 17, cup two. So this is the journeying cup. For I tell you from now on, verse 18, I shall not drink of the fruit of the vine until the, until the kingdom comes. Now, how many know when you go to heaven, there's going to be drinking of wine. 
Now, Malachi says that it's going to be a drink from Malachi 111, which would be the pure sacrifice. There has to be a pure sacrifice. What does a pure sacrifice as a mean to sacrifice? A sacrifice is when you realize what kind of straits you're in and you realize that you need something to do. My life is messed up. A pure sacrifice is when God does it for you and it's forever done. So how many would like to have the pure sacrifice of praise? When you are into prayer, you are praying the pure sacrifice of praise. So look at verse 18. I've always asked God to teach me what it means. I tell you from now on, you shall not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. What's that, everybody? The second kingdom, the second coming heaven. That's going to be your banqueting. Can you imagine what your reception is going to be with Jesus? But this banquet of the pure sacrifice in the kingdom, now fruit of the vine. Now, if you circle that expression, fruit of the vine, it is the unbelievable growth of the vine that never stops growing. If you received communion today worthily, it never stops giving. Then he says there, verse 19, he took bread, the matzah, and when he had given thanks, there it is the third time. You Eucharist, the end. What is the secret weapon to destroying everything that perturbs you? To give thanks. Toda, toda, and toda. T O D A H, T O D A H, T O D A H. He took the bread and when he had, how do you say bread? Lechem. How do you say in Greek? Artos. A R T O S. Artos. He took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to him, saying, Now notice something here very important. Jesus said, this is my body before the second cup. So what's happening during the second cup when he says, this is my body? He's journeying with you. What do we call the Eucharist? The food for the journey. When you give thanks in Judaism, the bread always has to be what? Elevated. When you're taking bread, you're giving thanks and he broke it. This is called the fractioning. When you give thanks like this and when you're involved in prayer, there is a prayer that says multiplication. This is happening during the second cup. He said this, my body, given for you. Now underline the word there three times for you. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem that night, it says for and for unto us the son is given. It's for you. When you pray the prayer before you eat, when you see the prayer before the Son of God comes, when the heavens are rent open, this is for you. So when we pray before meal and even after, there must always be an element of giving thanks. Toda. 
when something is done for me, I say to the person, thank you, thank you, thank you, or write them out a card, thank you, thank you, thank you, amen. But how many have said, this is for you? Now, he took the bread, verse 19, he had given thanks, he broke, and now that's the power of the fractioning multiplying. Uh, I always think right now of St. Elizabeth Ann Seton. When she had the, the, the fractioning going on, God was really multiplying with her. I need to talk to St. Elizabeth Ann Seton. When Mary said and received Jesus, you got to understand that in, if you read in between the lines, Mary said, make a miracle of my life. Use me in the miracle. When the miracle happens, what you do through me is multiplied. When that happens, that's the power of your prayer. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, box in there, as I told you, Deuteronomy 8. Deuteronomy, the eighth chapter. Because Deuteronomy means second law, and it's taking people through what they have forgotten to do. Jesus comes to live. So if you look at Deuteronomy 8, you can see there how many times you hear the word, remember, remember, don't forget, all right? So look at the times there and study do the remembering. That's the sense of remembering. So when we pray before meals, we bow our head to remember God's fidelity before. Are you getting this? Now, watch what happens when we pray God's fidelity after. Luke 22, verse 20. Likewise, the cup after supper. How many know you missed that? How many know you missed that today in church? Guess what cup that is? The cup of redemption. This is the call, you would say, the fullness of your marriage. This is when the two become one. Notice we had a cup. Now we have the prayer after we eat. Because we already ate the bread. The motzot. We did it in remembrance. And likewise, the cup after. So put down number three. Everybody put down number three. This cup which is poured out. Now poured out is a waterfall that never stops. Jesus said these words after the meal. He said, now that we ate the meal and we're going to the ultimate meal in the second kingdom, what's going to happen? You're going to have, if you experience after meal, the cup, what's going to happen to you, saints? You're going to have a poured out presence of God. I shared with the people today, when there was a rending of the heavens, there was a spark that came forth from the, the rending. Because if I rent my garment, you might not see it, but part of the cloth was torn. Some of it went spilling out. When Jesus is torn, his whole being came out. When they were praying today in Isaiah 63 to rent the heavens, what happened was the appearing of the Shekinah glory. Let the Shekinah glory explode. 
when you give thanks to the Almighty, there's a poured out power of God on you and there's a Shekinah about you. This cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant. I chose to put a star there. That's the beginning of the New Testament. The New Testament doesn't begin in Luke 1 when Jesus is born. That's not. We should have a day when we celebrate the birth of the New Testament. We do. We call it Eucharist. So every time you hear this, you are celebrating the birth of the New Testament. In the blood of Jesus, now written down through the power of remembrance, through a wedding with the banquet of the Lamb. So now, right there, you could put in there the new covenant in the blood, box in the word new covenant. That's Jeremiah 31, 31. Jeremiah 31, 31. There's only one time in the Old Testament that the word New Testament is mentioned. Only once. And that's only mentioned in Jeremiah 31, 31. When you open and give thanks after dinner, there's an amazing thing that happens to you. Jesus, number one, teaches you. You now have your own teacher is Jesus. And number two, he writes on your heart. I haven't got enough information on the new blessed in the church. That's it, Carlo. So can you imagine then, blessed Carlo, right at the ripe old age of 15, he's buried in Assisi. Interesting spot to be buried in, huh? And what he did at the age of 11, he fell in love with the Eucharist. Eucharistic adoration, Mama Mary, pretty good. And he was a catechist at the age of 11. I would not trust anybody at the age of 11 to teach my kids, except Blessed Carlo. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, the cup after supper. Number three, this cup, which is poured out in the new covenant. In my blood. So notice the second cup. The fourth cup is the cross. The fourth cup. And Catholic art always has an angel by the open side of Jesus. How many have seen that picture a million times? With the blood coming out and the angel catching it. Now, go with me, please, to Luke 24. Let's turn a few pages. All right, go to verse 28. All right, here comes the prayer after the meal. And now, sadly, we conclude our series on Jesus praying, Jesus surrounded by a prayer life. I know there's so much to say, and I would like to do a lot more on prayer. But we are moving to a new series, amen, which will take us on an interesting, phenomenal road of background. So they drew near to the village, which they were going. Now, the village is called Emmaus. In that village, it's the area that the Ark of the Covenant stayed before it entered Israel. Today, the name of the area is called Our Lady Ark of the Covenant. We just went to Israel. Now, in January, can you imagine? It'll be two years. Two years ago in January, 
and it's almost never on any tours. And we took you on that tour, didn't we? So you were on the very spot at the Ark of the Covenant State. Remember we went inside? And inside the church, they had an Ark of the Covenant. And then on the top of the church, they had Our Lady. Yeah. Our Lady, Ark of the Covenant. Now, just to give you a little background, we have two men walking away from what's happened in Israel, in Jerusalem. When we stood on that mountain and we looked straight out, we could see the outline of the whole city of Jerusalem. That was very exciting. Uh, of course, it was seven miles away. Now, this is from Eastern Christianity. How many know there's Eastern Catholics called Byzantines? Everybody know that? Now, you can all go to Mass and receive communion there any given Saturday night, Sunday you want. If you haven't done so, I, I highly recommend you do that. Highly recommend you go and experience what our Eastern Catholics experience. It's perfectly legitimate. Perfectly, you can receive Holy Communion. Perfectly um, fulfills your Sunday obligation. So please go there soon and experience an Eastern rite. If you like, especially Latin, it might be a, a real big blessing to you. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He appeared to be going further. Now, this happens uh, a couple of times because they got a call out, save us. Now, the other time that they called out to save us was remember when Jesus was walking on the water? It says he appeared to walk by them. Do you remember that? Now, when you're praying, Jesus is there, but you got to make sure that you invoke his name to stay there. So it's really important that we pray more with a reverence and devotedness. Now, let me tell you the two people from Eastern Catholicism, and you're the only ones on your block that know this. Are you ready for this? The two people on the road to Emmaus, which the Bible says, number one, Cleopas. Now remember, the wife was already at the cross. Does everybody remember that? So Mary Clopas is there at the cross. Clopas is far away, seven miles away at Emmaus. You got the picture? Next, this is from our Eastern Catholic brothers and sisters in Orthodoxy. The second person on the road to Emmaus is St. Luke. Okay, St. Luke was the second person on the road to Emmaus. Interesting, isn't it? He appeared to be going further, verse 29, but they constrained him saying, Stay with us. Now, in John chapter 1, when you get an invitation to the first kingdom, Jesus says, stay with me. Come and see. Do you remember that expression in John 1? Now, here in Luke 24, because of the greatness of what Jesus did, what did Jesus just do for them? Explain the word. So now notice, notice here we have a mass going on. Word and sacrament. Hello. Word, homily, sacrament. Hello. And what did Jesus do during that word? The Torah, the Psalms, and the Haf Torah. That's one of the prophets. Hmm. And then he preached. Hmm. So now, preceding everything we do in prayer, like the monks used to do yesteryear, even some still today, what always preceded a deep 
prayer life, even, hello, when you're eating scripture, that's praying after the meal. During the homily that Jesus gave, they're going to have an experience now of an explosion of the spirit. When you pray, before and during with the word, and you're gathering around, what cup did we just pass through? Number two and number three. Are you getting all this? Stay with us this toward evening. All right, everybody put in there the new extended day. Now, this is Resurrection Sunday. Remember Resurrection Sunday, but guess what happens? Because they begged him, stay with us. Now inviting him to do what he did to them in Luke chapter, in, in John chapter 1. The day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table, he took the bread and blessed it. Now, to see Jesus doing this, he's risen. He has to take the bread and what? Artos, lechem in Hebrew. He has to lift it up. Notice what Jesus does. He takes now the bread and the power of what we need to do every Sunday is now shown to the whole world. So he takes the bread, he blesses it. No, blessing means this. When we say bless us, O oh Lord, do you, do you think you have any idea what you're saying? When you say bless us, O oh Lord, you're saying multiply it. Now watch this. He took the bread, blessed it, broke it. See the multiplication? See the fraction? Gave it to them. Gave it to them. So it was bread, it was blessed, it was broken, and now the giving. When our people's eyes open, when we give it to them. Their eyes were opened. Underline this there. They recognized him. Why did they recognize him? For several reasons. They heard about the Eucharist, number one. And number two, they saw his hands. And then you know what they said? Oh, my God. Then, what were they doing? This is the first Eucharistic adoration. Can you imagine them staring? Now, what did Jesus do? He vanished. When was the last time Jesus did that? Blessed Mother, saying, let it be done to me according to your word. The angel vanished. When you look at that and say, I believe, God does not need to be seen by you then. Because it's already taken over your whole being. When this happens, you got to understand. Please understand. Holy Spirit, help them to understand. Help me to understand, too, a matter of fact. This is the first time. It's only an earthly revelation. Did not our hearts burn within us when he preached the Bible to us and while he opened 
to us the scriptures. So now notice we have the word and the Eucharist coming together. When it comes together, then you can see an explosion of why we need word and sacrament. Then for the first time, they began to really understand Jesus is Messiah. Jesus is the Christ. We're not our hearts burning within us. We're not our hearts burning within. So they proclaimed him Mashiach. Did not our hearts burn within us while he walked on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose. Now, metaphorically, we can say they got up from the table, correct. But guess what? They rose from the dead at that moment. That's why we pray before and after. I wish, I know we're hungry. I wish we could have a more devoted prayer instead of the one, two, three rush job. If you get indigestion, your prayer didn't go down right. That's praying before and after the meal. Now, in Revelation 19, the first word you're going to say before your beloved is hallelujah. But it's going to go further. You're going to say the rest of the word of your beloved's full name. When we say hallelujah, we only say half of his name. So go with me to Revelation 19. And then I want to take you on an unbelievable journey. Uh, in Hebrew that will transform you. When we say the word God, and I'm going to show you where it starts to appear for the first time, the Y-H-W-H. It's called the four letters of God. Now, when it starts to appear for the first time is in, in Genesis 2. When it starts to appear, you can see it's called Yahava. Because in some circles of Judaism, the H is silent. When you look at the word Yahava, everybody can spell it? Y-H-A-A-V-A, -A -A, Yahava. Now, where am I getting my information? I told you the two sources. Number one, the book of Jubilees. And number two, the book of the Dead Sea Scrolls. By the way, each of them are not difficult for you to read. Uh, I think you're all smart. And I think you can all get it pretty easily. Do I hear amen? Now, everybody look at the word Yahava. Now, there's three things. Look at the word. Y-A-H, the name for God. The shortened version. Look at the next next word in that word. Ahava. That is the other word, which I've told you a few times. Love. So if you want to say in Hebrew, love, you say Ahava. Now remember times we've been talking about the merciful love. We call that has said. So when God reveals himself, and by the way, when's the best day God reveals himself? Sunday. And that's why you should never leave church early because you got to pray before you eat and after you eat. Hello? Is this making sense? You should never walk out the door what they've been telling you. Uh, everybody receive communion and walk out the door. Ay, 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 no. So everybody look at Yah, Y-H, God's name. Everybody look at the word Ahava. That is the word for love. 
What does that love mean? That love there means God self-revealing him to you. God self-revealing himself to you. The third word in there is Ava. That's the word for Eve. And what does the word Eve mean? The mother of the living. God reveals himself to us through the mother of all living. So just by the fact that we are created men and women, no abortion, please. We are alive. Amen. Isn't that good stuff? Do you see the three words in there? That is the original wording for the word for God. Go now to Revelation 19. This is the moment that we go to heaven. After this, I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying. Hallelujah. Now, put a little note there if you haven't done so already. This is the first time hallelujah is mentioned in the Bible, in the New Testament. You want to know when it's mentioned in the Old Testament, Psalm 111. Salvation and glory and power and belong to our God. Now, when you walk into heaven, you'll be walking into the banquet. Now, look at those three words there. Salvation, glory, and power belong to our God. This is the concluding part of Revelation of praise and worship. When you get into full praise of God, the first thing you say is salvation. Now, an interesting thing happens when you start to worship God. There's always a crescendo of worship. Let me explain it this way. When you study Revelation and you're praising God, there are three words that describe God in worship. Then it goes to four words. Then it goes to seven words. Why, why seven? And it stops there? Not that it stops. Seven means fullness. So now, what do you do? Praise, worship, salvation, power. Do you see it? Do you see what happens when you go to the praying after meals? When you pray after your meals, there should be a prayer of praise, worship, salvation. Now, I just got a shock because as I've been studying, Protestants are now believing in the three days of darkness. I almost fell down. They talked about the three days of darkness coming. Went, Whoa, I better pay attention to see what's going on here. We are in a physical darkness now. We're in a spiritual darkness, obviously. But let me tell you something, what's going to be happening. Very soon, very soon, there's going to be a mighty light from heaven shining upon you. Then he says to us, for his judgments are true and, and just. This is repeating uh, Revelation 15. It's the song of singing. When you go into prayer after meal, there's a power of singing. Now, did you go to church today? You should always leave singing with the prayers after meal. With the prayer after meal, you sing, you get the blessing, and then you sing. His judgments are true and honest. He has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication. More about the corruption in, in, um, in a few sessions coming. He avenged on her the blood of his servants, and those are the prophets. Once more they cried out, Hallelujah! The smoke goes up to her forever and ever. Verse 20, verse 4. 
the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped, see the worship, who is seated on the throne saying, amen, hallelujah. Now notice the amen. It's established, it's true. Hallelujah. And from the throne, a voice crying, praise our God, all you servants, you who fear him. All around the throne, there are seven spirits around the throne of God. Amen. And they said, the throne came, praise our God, all your servants, you who fear him, and small and great. Verse 6, then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude. All the redeemed people will be there. This is the eternal banquet of the Lamb. This is your banquet. This is the banquet of the Lamb. Then I heard what seemed to be the great voice of a multitude. Now, the sound of many waters. Everybody write in there, Psalm 29. When you go to your eternal banquet, there's going to be the great crashing of the water. Because God's going to speak. As God spoke through the prophet Eliyahu, Elijah, so will he speak through you. Now, watch this. I told you now. You are going to become officially the wife. So now, here he comes. Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory. Here comes the glory, the doxa. Now what's the doxa? In him, through him, with him. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the Lamb. When you went to church today, those were the same words. You're at the marriage of the Lamb. What cup is that, everybody? Three. But now we're going into cup number four. This is honeymoon time. Can you imagine on your honeymoon with the savior of the entire universe? Can you imagine you in Jesus' time? Can you imagine your alone time with the king of kings? I don't know how he's going to pull it off. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. He has granted her to be clothed with fine linen. So as soon as we walk in, fine linen. You see, when Jesus went to the cross, it was majestic. And he wore fine linen of a priest on seamless garment. Now put in there verse 8. This is your clothes. This is what we dressed. I remember when I was growing up, the first time we'd been down the shore, it was the seaside park. Not the wild ride it could have been in these recent years. And every time we went to dinner, we had to dress up. How would you like to go on vacation and dress up? But if you wanted your dinner that's already paid for, you dress up. And so we all got dressed up because we're going to the dinner. For the linen underlined there is the righteous deeds of the saints. Now, this is God's life. This is Jesus through you, on you. Now watch this. The prayer after the meal. The angel, the angelo, said to me, verse 9. This is called a beatitude. Remember, we always think of the beatitudes located in Matthew 5. Mm -hmm. But the Beatitudes are sprinkled through the Bible. Blessed are those embodied to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Because when there's a consummation in Judaism, then the supper begins. Now, you didn't do that. You had your dinner, and then you consumed your marriage afterwards. But because he died on the cross... In Judaism, you go upstairs, you consume your, you, you consummate your marriage, you show everybody downstairs because they're virgins. 
And then you have cause to rejoice. So that's why I say the Virgin Jesus showed us his blood. And that's why when we go to pray after meals, we go to pray at our wedding banquet. Look what God has done with the blood of the lamb. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Verse 10. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. The angel said, don't do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brethren who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. Don't worship me. Here's an amazing statement. In verse 10. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Testimony means from John chapter 1, martyr, to give you a testimony means when you walk in, I want everybody to envision you walking in, and when you see Jesus in the full-blown reality, and you see, this is the testimony. Here's what testimony means. My people, my daughter, my son, I stand in front of you now as one who has laid down my life for you. So as these eternal vows are now exchanged, I have kept to you my promise and my word. Because I take your hand, it is totally fulfilled now in our midst. I fulfill everything you are waiting for in your life. I will not waver from it. This is now shown to the entire universe. Because I am Jesus. King of kings and Lord of lords. This is the spirit of prophecy. Every prophecy and word you want to give must deal with this prophecy going forth. Every prophecy you give, it has to have this spirit upon it. Every prophecy you read about in the Bible lives in this spirit. I am your Lord. I am your groom. I desire to be with you forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. I love you your loving savior. And then you will say, for the first time ever in the spirit of prophecy, you will say his name. Now, what did Mary do? Mary did something very unusual. In the Magnificat, she called him holy. Now, along with Mary, in the spirit of prophecy, as Mary is kneeling before him, we will call him by his full name, know the correct pronunciation, stronger than Yahava, with all that it means. Now, next week, we go right into the blessing and the power of what that will mean for you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for studying weeks and weeks and weeks on prayer, how Jesus prayed, the times he was surrounded in prayer, 
how he taught us to pray. May we never forget over 20, 30, 40 sessions on learning how to pray in the spirit. May we always be men and women of prayer and teach us how to pray. Amen.